This story is called A Terminal Case. His eyes snapped open. He looked around the room in a panic. Where the hell am I? Then he remembered. Austria. Salzburg, Austria. That's where I am. He lay back in the bed. He was drenched with sweat. Then before he could stop, he remembered it all. The strange series of accidents that had caused him to run. The car crash. Falling over the side of the cliff. The ear operation, which had left him unable to keep his balance. While he was still recuperating, his wife had informed him that she was leaving him. The nightmares started almost immediately, followed by the spells, those terrible black spells. His doctor had told him he was severely depressed. But he knew it was more than that. He knew if he didn't do something drastic, he'd either crack up or kill himself. So he did what he always did. He called up the travel agent, and he ordered a plane ticket. He looked over in the bed at the sleeping figure next to him. One breast was exposed, lying free of the sheet. He reached out, and he touched the tip of a one brown nip nipple. It immediately hardened. He lay there and watched her, regarding in particular the muscularity of her arms and shoulders. She had a fine body, no doubt about it. Yet somehow, she didn't attract him. She looked rather like a man. It must be very early, he thought. Everything was so quiet. But just as he thought this, he heard a distinct pop from somewhere outside. Then everything was still once again. He slipped out from beneath the covers and, naked, ran to the bathroom. Damn, that fucking house was freezing. Once inside, he let go a strong stream of piss into the toilet. As he was going, he saw the bowl on the floor. It had his name, Martin, written on it in bright red lettering. When he'd finished, he picked up the bowl and looked at it. There was a happy face drawn under the name. Cute. Real cute. This was Heidi's way of reminding him that he always left a drop or two of urine on the floor before zipping up. You men are all the same, she had scoffed in her guttural German voice. Big babies. She had a way of holding on to her S's just a little too long, which infuriated him. After slipping on a sweatshirt and a pair of jeans, he went out into the front uh, yard. Outside, the air was crisp and cold. He looked down the street at the row of houses. Each one was perfect, with their little square-cut lawns and perfectly tended gardens. A few of the people were already out watering their lawns. Well, he thought to himself, it's exactly what you wanted. No jerks, no Mexicans, no Manson people cruising up and down the streets with idiot grins on their faces, looking to butt-fuck you or shoot your face off. No, he was as far, as far away from all that as one could be. He walked down the street, fascinated by the clip-clop sound of his heels on the pavement. Even the quality of the sound here was different. More separation between the sounds. More space. A beautiful girl on a bicycle wheeled towards him. When she got close, he saw that she looked exactly like his wife, so much so that he was tempted to call after her. But he knew it was only his imagination. He'd be seeing ghosts for a long while, that was for sure. Soon he noticed one house which stood out from the rest. Unlike the other houses, it was not well cared for at all. Inside the fenced-up yard, all sorts of junk was piled up. Old tires, bottles, and cards, boards, and bricks... Then he made out the figure of an old man puttering around amidst the garbage. Heidi had told him about the man. Everyone in the neighborhood knew him. He collected junk. Sometimes he made things out of it. What's more, he kept swarms of bumblebees in hives around the house. He didn't collect the honey or anything. He just liked bees. As he approached the house, he saw the bee man fiddling, fiddling around with a pile of tin cans. Guten Morgen, he said. The bee man didn't reply. He just stared at him, sort of goggle-eyed. There was a trickle of spittle running from the corner of his mouth. He was clearly quite insane. Blork, said the bee man, or something like that. Blork, blork, blork. The man had inserted a finger in his nose, and, and he was digging around pretty good now. Then he turned and scurried off, mumbling, and mumbling to himself into his piles of junk. A few houses down, a group of people were gathered. A white ambulance was out front, its lights flashing. A moment later, two men bearing a stretcher came out of the house. 
He approached a woman who was watering her garden. Was Max? he asked. She gave him a quick once-over. They're selbstmord, she said. She saw that he didn't understand her. Suicide, she said. One shot in the brains early this morning. At once he remembered the popping sound he'd heard earlier. He wanted to ask the woman more, but she had already returned to watering her garden. When he got back home, Heidi was in the kitchen drinking coffee. She was attired in a peach-colored bathrobe. I think the man a few doors down just killed himself, he told her. They were taking the body away when I walked by. <clears throat> to his surprise, Heidi's only reaction was to raise her eyebrows, which was rather curious since she had almost no eyebrows to speak of. She continued to sip noisily at her coffee. It's quite common here, you know, she finally said. Here? Austria, we have a very high suicide rate, one of the highest in the world. Heidi got up and immediately began washing her cup. She was a very clean person. Well, it makes sense, he thought. All those neat little perfect houses, so clean, so tidy, too regimented, too constricted. Nope, there had to be some price to be paid for all that per perfection. Heidi was tiling, toweling off the table now, so she had let her robe fall open so that he could see her small, tight breasts. For a moment, there was a dark flash of pubis. He pretended not to notice. When she was done rinsing her cup, Heidi walked outside to get the paper. She made no attempt to close her bathrobe. She always seemed to be exposing herself like this, taking off her top around the public pool or something. She sort of forced her nakedness upon her, upon you, thrust it about. Somehow it wasn't sexy or even attractive. In fact, it was kind of obscene, this aggressive nakedness of hers. Just as he thought this, she walked by and managed to rub a breast against his arm on the way to the bathroom. The next instant, he heard the shower running. A moment later, she stuck her head out the door. You did it again, she said. Did what? he asked. She held up the little pea bowl for him to see. You must learn to shake your thing. Otherwise, you will always leave the drippy drop. She was smiling crookedly now. I'm sorry. I really am. Heidi clucked her tongue, then said, You will learn. I have confidence in you. Oh, now, don't forget, we are going to the play in town tonight. Eight promptly, so you must be ready. And please, wear something besides those old blue jeans of yours. Okay, he said. He wished she would hurry up and close the door. He could feel one of his spells coming over him feel it pulling down the edges of his mouth. When she finally shut the bathroom door, he sat at the kitchen table, buried his face in his hands, and wept bitterly. In the shower, he could hear Hardy, Heidi singing a Joni Mitchell song. When the play was over that night, he, Heidi, and her friend Hans, a bearded student type who chained, smoked gold was, and had extremely bad teeth, sat at an outdoor cafe. He had hated the play, in fact, the only thing he liked about her was one line which was spoken by a character called the Negger Boxer, or the Nigger Boxer in English. He thought he'd heard the line before, but he liked it anyhow. It said simply, in this life, we are all terminal cases. Heidi and Hans were speaking in English, but he had difficulty understanding what they were saying. Their words kept getting inter interrupted in his mind by the popping sound he'd heard that morning. Martin, what's the matter? Heidi said. She was looking at him sort of funny. Oh, I'm just a little dizzy is all. I think I'll walk back home. He got up and left the restaurant. As he walked back along the river bank, he began feeling better. All the little houses looked so pretty at night. Inside each one there were lights on. And in each house he knew there were people. People with thoughts and ideas and dreams. People with lives. It was so curious, for somehow he had no life. For some reason, he had been relegated to the status of a permanent observer. It had always been like this. When he reached Heidi's house, his bladder was bursting. He made straight for the bathroom. As he unzipped, he saw the bowl on the floor with his name on it. He looked at it for a long while. Then he aimed at the bowl and let go. Soon the bowl overflowed onto the bathroom floor. He continued pissing on the floor, then proceeded to make a nice little design up and down the walls soaking the towels and the roll of toilet paper in the process. Still, his bladder wasn't empty. 
He continued pissing in the sink and finished off by soaking Heidi's brand new water pick toothbrush. Then he went to the bedroom, packed his bag, and called a cab. When the driver arrived, he told him to take him to the train station. Two days later, he arrived in the town of Lille. He gave the taxi driver directions to find the hospital. Twenty minutes later, they arrived at an old graying brick building located at the edge of the sea. He walked up and down the ugly gray corridors, past the people in white smocks who sat silently staring at nothing. Soon he found the room he was looking for, 200C. He went in. She was sitting in her wheelchair, her head down on her chest, just like the people in the hallways. Laurence, he said. Laurence. She looked up at once and her face brightened. Oh, Martin. Oh, it's you. God, I didn't think you would come. I told you to, I talked to your parents last week as soon as they told me about it. I told them that I'd be here. Didn't they tell you? But she didn't answer. She just opened her, her arms for him to come to her. He went over and embraced her. I've lost weight, she said, embarrassed. embarrassed. Oh, God, my poor baby, he thought. You're so thin. She couldn't have weighed more than 80 pounds. I start physical therapy next week, she told him. They can do things now, you know, with computers. Perhaps I will be able to walk again. They said maybe a year. Her voice trailed off. Hey, he said, you want to go look at the ocean? Oh, yes, that would be wonderful. Good, come on, let's get the hell out of here. He put a blanket over her legs. God, they were so terribly thin. And he wheeled her out through the st stark gray corridors outside into the warm sunlight. It's nice, no, he said. It's nice, yes, she smiled. On the way to the beach, they passed other people, pushing family members or friends in wheelchairs. People smiled or nodded silent hellos as they passed one another. When they reached the edge of the sand, they found a wooden ramp which led down to the sea. The sky was beginning to turn gray, and the ocean was billowing, billowing up in little tufts. Something seemed slightly ominous about the setting, but he didn't say this to her. She looked so happy. Too windy for you, he asked. Oh, no, it's wonderful. Please, let's go out some more. I want to watch the waves. Finally, they found a spot and stopped. They sat there saying nothing. A few feet away, a pretty little girl wearing leg braces was playing with her mother. Come to Mama, come to Mama, oh, baby, the mother said, holding her arms out. The little girl giggled and went hippity-hop, hippity-hop to her mother, who shook her hair and laughed. He noticed that he had a lump in his throat. It was such a pretty sight, one simply couldn't bear to look at it for too long. He and Laurence sat inside, silence. He looked at the profile of her face, so classically French. The long nose, the f high forehead, the wide mouth, lips slightly pursed. She looked rather like a Gauguin, he thought. Not at all pretty in the dull American way. No, she was truly beautiful. He put his hand in her lap, and she covered it with her own. Then he ba began speaking very softly, almost as if he were talking to himself. You remember that winter we slept in the attic of that old house, how we stayed up all night telling each other stories? God, remember how scared you were of that one I told you about Peter and the wolf? Jesus, and it was cold, remember? We had that big eider-down quilt, but we still had to sleep all scrunched up uh, so we wouldn't freeze to death. God, those were good times, weren't they? But Laurence didn't answer. She was looking at him now, with the strangest expression on her face. My God, she said, your eyes. Martin, what's the matter with your eyes? My eyes, he said. I don't know what you mean. Laurence looked very frightened. She started to reach over to touch his face, but just then something began to happen. There was a commotion on the surface of the sea, almost as if, Something were bubbling under there. Then, suddenly, a gull shot straight out over the ocean and fell up at the sky. It was going hideously fast. They both watched it in horror. When the gull finally hit the top of the sky, there was a loud popping sound. Then it burst into a million pieces. The end.